Hello and welcome to today's session. So we have been looking at a number of plays which are representative of 20th century American uh, drama. So today uh, uh, in this session and in the next couple of uh, uh, sessions too, we will spend some time looking at the historical background and how in general these plays have been framed historiographically, how they have been seen together as a body of writing, you know, just as the title of this course uh, suggests, 20th century American drama. So we are looking at the Cambridge history of American theater. This is a volume three, and it looks, as, uh, looks at the plays and major trends, the movements uh, which defined American theater in the post-World War period, the post-Second World War period. So today we will look at this introduction by Christopher Bixby, which gives us the uh, sense of what had been happening uh, with American drama since the Second World War. So this gives us uh, <clears throat> a sense of continuity and it also identify the major departures which define American drama, particularly from the Second uh, World War period onwards. And this incidentally, you know, we also uh, in uh, course of the discussion of uh, the place that we have already looked at, we too uh, realize that there has been a shift. There has been a shift in certain trends. You know, there is, of course, you know, a, a, an overarching theme of the American dream which is presented in various ways and we find, you know, uh, the way in which the each character responds to this notion of American dream is very different depending on their social setting, depending on their gender location, depending on their racial location. So here, you know, this uh, uh, introduction gives us a sense of, a complete sense of these shifts by not just looking at, you know, the American drama, but also, you know, how the uh, changing uh, shifts in American society, in American polity has uh, also been getting reflected in 20th century American drama. So uh, it tells us about, you know, how this, uh, the previous volumes have been telling us the story of uh, uh, the emergence of uh, Broadway theatre, the emergence of major playwrights, a shift from melodrama to new realism and from that realism to a self-conscious experimentalism. So we saw the, uh, from, you know, from the first play that we looked at from Eugene O'Neill's, uh, The Emperor Jones, uh, from Eugene O'Neill's Emperor Jones, uh, we find that, you know, there is a shift from, uh, uh, you know, towards realism, there's a departure from realism, yeah, and this is all, you know, set in the, uh, in, in, a, in a very uh, realist setting, so to speak, you know, the setting of uh, contemporary America. Uh, it identified the extent to which theatre reflected social change, yeah, and this is also something that we continue to notice even in the latest play that we looked at, uh, uh, Hansbury's, Lorraine Hansbury's play, A Raisin in the Sun, you know, the contemporary changes in the uh, the social demographics, the changes in the uh, social hierarchy, all these things, you know, or at least the initiatives towards that, they all get reflected in our, uh, uh, the theatre. So uh, we find, you know, America moving from a rural economy towards an urban economy. It's engaging in a modernity with, which both delighted and appalled and found in social inequity. Uh, you know, this becomes a source of dramatic energy as well. These are the things that we had been uh, witnessing in the number of plays that we engaged with. And we also find that in some form or the other, you all will be able to identify particular instances that would fit these descriptions. And um, yeah, through boom and depression, the theater in all its guises, from the little theatre movement to the federal theatre, Broadway comedies and musicals to powerful dramas or social of social and psychological experience, proved to public art with public appeal. So we do find that uh, it is not just an art for art's sake uh, sort of uh, uh, continuity that we find in American theatre. As you know, as we also noticed earlier, it's also, you know, there's a sense of art for truth's sake, yeah. And we find that it continues to respond to the theatre movements, the uh, changing trends and the themes, they all, in some sense or the other, they continue to reflect what is happening in, uh, the, in, in, in the public sphere. Uh, yet already that role was threatened by the emergence of Hollywood, a headlay television. By the turn of the 21st century, hundreds of channels would be available where cyberspace would exert its own seductive allure. Meanwhile, the economics of an art, which required the collaborative efforts of a large number of people, used its plant inefficiently and was often inconveniently situated, made it potentially less attractive than other arts or forms of entertainment. It also you know, gives us a sense of how this form uh, of uh, performance, how this 
genre began to decline with the onslaught of you know other modes of uh, entertainment it's not something that you know we will be looking at uh, in detail at the moment yeah so we find that you know around this period in the post war period we find the decline of broadway so broadway declined a decline balanced by the emergence in new york of uh, off and off off broadway uh, so a similar development was to occur in chicago and elsewhere indeed the dominance of new york itself came to an end as regional theaters spread throughout the country generating plays that then fed back to broadway reversing the flow of pre war world yeah so this is you know quite similar to what happened in england too there was a point when uh, london used to be the center of all forms of entertainment all kinds of you know cultural and uh, uh, political activities but here we here also you know we find a similar trend that you know the there is a reversal of the flow of uh, a place that you know it begins to expand it begins to spread uh, throughout the length and breadth of the country the presumed homogeneity of the audience no longer prevails so it's also you know uh, as this genre is uh, on expanding we find that you know its breadth is also growing in some sense an increasing awareness of what it entails to uh, to 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 perform yeah so it's also telling us about what had been happening from the 1930s and 40s onwards eugene o'neill succumbs to uh parkinson like uh, disease and it frustrates his efforts to write and uh, it it also you know um, i mean he continues to write for a bit but you know his uh, uh you know as as uh, uh, brooks we also points out uh he uh, what do we you know happened in his life you know from there you know he picked up the raw materials of plays that confronted his characters with their failure to realize the hopes that had once energized and now ironized them plays whose very bleakness he had judged too great for war time audiences yeah and then uh two other um, uh, playwrights also emerge in the mid 1940s we've taken a look at them too tennessee williams and arthur miller both in their 30s at the time of their first broadway successes and they were also shaped by the previous decade and they also you know uh, reflected the mood of uh, the times the political si- times uh, the uh, socio cultural times and miller you know in particular took pride in his uh, uh, sensitive nature he had the sensitivity his plays had the sensitivity to respond to the contemporary times and we do you know have looked at two of uh, miller's plays which uh, amply reflects that uh, uh, sentiment uh, and uh, unil also we find that you know he moves from uh a lyric celebration of the outsider to an exuberant expressionism to a strained realism a naturalism which mocked its own assumptions we find his later plays becoming a very different from say emperor jones we find him experimenting of course you know we did see how the expressionist techniques were majorly experimented with in the uh, in emperor jones and we find those trend uh, those trends also undergoing changes from within too and uh, we uh, do you know there's a uh, there are a lot of other things too which happen uh, around this time and the 50s and 60s are very turbulent too we find the players responding to that we also find that the world climate the world political climate is also changing drastically to which america also needs to respond and oddly the crisis within america it's not something which is entirely brought about through political or social uh, or cultural tragedies you know as daniel bell observes uh, you know about the 1950s american mid century is in many respects a turbulent country oddly enough it's a turbulence born not of depression but of prosperity yeah i think this is very relatable when we also put this in context with the you know when we compare this uh, with the place that we have uh, read through it's a turbulence it's a dilemma it's a crisis which is born not entirely out of depression but out of prosperity which is very very interesting as you would see contrary to somewhat simple notion that prosperity dissolves all social problems the american experience demonstrates that the prosperity that prosperity brings in its wake new anxieties new strains new urgencies so in a nutshell this is something that we witness in most of the place that we have looked at there are new anxieties new strains new urgencies which were not there in the previous decade which is why you know the trends uh, that it becomes uh, extremely important to experiment with genre experiment with different uh, uh, modes of performances yeah so this is something you know daniel bell observed in his work the end of ideology which is a uh, uh, hugely interesting work for you to take a look at if you are interested uh, in it uh, so uh, it it also he uh, uh, no the author continues to state america immediately after the war may have celebrated its renewed status as a city on the hill 
and many of its citizens began to dream of a familiar dream. There were others and many writers among them for whom the logic of history had other lessons to teach than America's steady rise towards the empyrean. Yeah? So, uh, if you look at you know, Miller's plays or at uh, Tennessee Williams' plays, we find that it's also about this uh, alternate existence, about the alternate history and the lessons that the America had to offer, not just this homogeneous uh, journey towards the American dream. So Daniel Bell in another work, you know, the coming of post-industrial society, he notes this about you know, the emergence of a consciousness, a new polymorphous sensuality, the lifting of repression, the permeability of madness and normality, the new psychedelic awareness, the exploration of pleasure. Yeah? But this is not how the world seemed in 1945 when the war ended. And Americans celebrated the return of what they took to be normalcy. So in the, uh, the post-World War period, when most of the Americans thought they were returning to normalcy, they were actually returning to new anxieties and new crises. Like now, uh, All My Sons it talks about uh, the kind of prosperity that war brings, the material, com the material uh, uh, wealth that war brings, you know, the wartime prosperity, and the discomfort that certain individuals or you know an entire family might have with it you know that uh, becomes a reason for conflict yeah so the fathers in conflict is also because of this divide you know as uh, we would see in uh, not just in all my sons but in a few other plays as well and this is the stark reality in some sense what america was facing and now you know if you try to map uh, this against the place you know it would begin to mo make more sense too Philip Roth in his American uh, Pastoral, he speaks about the clock of history being reset as Americans celebrated the end of the Second World War. Everything was in motion. Men were back from Europe and Japan. America was the sole possessor of the bomb. What could rest is the newly unleashed energy of a nation, politically secure and economically booming. We find that the world order had completely changed. The power equations had completely changed. And America as a nation, in a, in a technical sense, in a theoretical sense, is indeed celebrating this resetting of the clock of history. Because, you know, we find, you know, all equations that we were hitherto familiar with in terms of international politics, everything has changed in the post-World War period. But what has that done? What did that do to the individuals and to the families? And that is something increasingly we find that the American theater was trying to unravel, was trying to expose in some sense. So the, the fundamental aim which was uh, almost um, thrust upon every individual was to make something of yourselves. And, you know, as uh, they all uh, also foreground that they were steered relentlessly in the direction of success. Yeah? So it is this journey towards success and the multiple failures or the alternate paths which do not take one to uh, the conventional modes of success. That is sometimes, you know, in some sense, the the crux of most of the plays that we have looked at as well. So in this introduction, you know, it's also highlighting the emergence of uh, uh, consumerism as a new uh, way of living, as a new mode of living. Yeah? So, you know, he's giving some uh, very specific examples. The one car family became the two car family. Television plugged Americans into a common cerebral cortex. The consumer society consumed. Yeah? You know, in uh, Abdike's uh, short story, When Everyone Was Pregnant, yeah, so uh, there, uh, you know, guiltlessness. Our fat 50s cars, how we loved them, revved them, no thought of pollution, romance of consumption at its height, shopping for baby food in the gaudy trash of the supermarkets, purchasing power, young, newly powerful, born to consume. Yeah? So the new terms that the American society and most capitalist societies are coming to terms with, you know, consumerism, the power to consume, yeah? and the purchasing power becomes another uh, mode of you know world power which is also aiding this change of equations yeah and indeed the world had changed profoundly the sky had been lit up by the twin sons of hiroshima and nagasaki and when the soviet union broke the american monopoly on nuclear destruction and china was lost for the first time our country previously invulnerable to attack felt deeply vulnerable and since its military and scientific preeminence had been an article of faith such catastrophes could only be a result of treachery and subversion yeah. so this you know these are the things which haven't come across haven't been uh, part of you know the plays that we have so far uh, dealt with but we do know that you know 
there are the the anxiety uh, the stress the conflicts within families the conflicts which look as if you know it, it's an individual conflict it is in fact very heavily handed down from and through these you know the the decisions made by the state now this is something you know we can find getting reflected in a uh, some of Albi's play to his place too. We saw that in uh, the zoo story. The new world was urban, or at best suburban, and beyond the glitter of consumer products, was increasingly perceived as charged with tensions, infected with deep insecurities, sexual, financial, racial. So that in, we saw this in the zoo story. We saw this in a raisin in the sun. Yeah. So it operates. The anxieties operate at multiple levels, and by the time you know they begin to articulate themselves, even to the point of driving individuals and families to uh, different tragic circumstances, we realize that it is also you know, not really within the individual's control. Things seem to have gone entirely out of the individual control, with an overarching system governing uh, their decisions sometimes you know even on a daily basis what was at stake was a sense of identity and purpose something you know which we saw uh, very heavily in the latest play that we looked at a reason in the sun unsurprisingly this was felt most acutely by those whose grip on national myths and realities was most tenuous the jewish and the Af jewish and african american writer which is precisely what we witnessed in hansbury's uh, play so in uh, this context, when you know one is looking at these uh, plays, uh, where the American dream is big deal in so many uh, different ways, we find that you know the American uh, dream becomes an evasion, merely the expression of a need for coherence and meaning. A project whose in fine indefinite deferral is a judgment equally of the individual and his society. Yeah. So uh, it's very interesting to look at the American dream as an evasion over here. Again, you know, I encourage you to think about Arthur Miller's play, where uh, you know perhaps you know one of the earliest explorations, critical explorations of the American dream and dream and its uh, uh, different facets were foregrounded. So there, when Willie Lowman, as uh, the author says in Death of a Salesman, tries to offer his false dreams as an inheritance to his sons, he acknowledges a failure which touches very directly on his sense of himself. You find this intergenerational uh, intertwining over here. A uh, tragedy, a dream as well as a tragedy, a dream as well as a dissolution which is passed on to the next generation simultaneously. And that is what, you know, the American dream apparently ends up doing. It is sort of an evasion. One does not look at the uh, imminent crisis uh, in hand, but on the other hand, chooses to pass on a dream, which might also lead to a lot of insecurities, which perhaps is already breeding a lot of anxieties. So as uh, uh, you know, uh, Eric Fromm observes in The Art of Loving, when a person feels that he has not been able to make sense of his own life, he tries to make sense of it in terms of the life of his children. You know, think about the place, uh, again, you know, Miller's place, and um, think about how uh, in Glass Menagerie, uh, the, the parents, the including, you know, the absent parent, there is a way in which, uh, you know, leaves a burden onto the, uh, the children. But one is bound to fail within oneself and for the children. The former, because the problem of existence can only be solved by each one for himself and not by proxy. The latter, because one lacks in the very qualities which one needs to guide the children in their own search for an answer. Yeah. So this is, uh, you know, this is increasingly visible in the fragile characters of uh, uh, Tennessee Williams in those, you know, um, uh, uh, in, in uh, Arthur Miller's characters who seem to be destined. Uh, uh, to move closer towards, you know, failure, the way, you know, um, uh, if, if uh, their lives could be defined as ontological opposites of what success meant in the American society then. And in the zoo story also, we find that, you know, there are these absent parents and hence there is no dream. There is nothing, in fact, that, uh, uh, in, in, you know, uh, a character can inherit as, uh, you know, we noticed in uh, the zoo story. And this also leads to a lot of uh, uh, paranoia, as most characters whom we have met through these plays, you know, they seem to be paranoid in some form or the other. Now, very briefly, let's also talk about Edward Albee's uh, uh, The Sue Story, again, in you know, 1959. Yeah? So this, in fact, you know, in some sense, it could be defined as unprogrammatic alienation, a rebellion without a cause. 
Uh, so uh, Kenneth Keniston in his work, uh, The Uncommitted, this is how, you know, he uh, talks about this descriptor, talks about this mood, which we also find getting reflected in Alvi's uh, the zoo story. Alienation, estrangement, disaffection, anomie, withdrawal, disengagement, separation, non-involvement, apathy, indifference and neutralism, all of these terms point to a sense of loss, a growing gap between men and their social world. The drift of a time is away from connection, relation, communion and dialogue and where intellectual concerns reflect this conviction. Alienation, once seen as imposed on men by an unjust economic system, is increasingly chosen by men as their basic stance towards society. Yeah. And this is, you know, as uh, uh, Keniston would say, this reflects the mood of Albi's uh, zoo story. And this is, a, and of course, a play which is produced on the cusp of the 60s in which the protagonist is withdrawn, disaffected, acutely aware of the gap between himself and others, and he has chosen alienation. Yeah. So this is a very important term. It is not as if alienation was imposed on him. Yeah. And due to the various circumstances, a lot of things were imposed on him, but he chooses alienation. If you again see this as a type, as a type of an individual who is forced to make such choices because of the circumstances, you know, uh, and, and, and Albi's uh, American dream also, it makes uh, further sense. Uh, modern man has transformed himself into a commodity. He is alienated from himself, from his fellow men, from nature, consoled by the strict routine of bureaucratized mechanical work. To, and and, and, uh, and uh, uh, this becomes something which uh, describes the characteristics of most of Albi's uh, uh, protagonists. So having said that, it would be interesting to take a look at this chronological chart, the timeline of post-World uh, uh, War Theatre. And this uh, here we find that, you know, the theatrical events in America is mapped against uh, two other uh, I don't know, uh, kinds of milestones. One is elected historical or cultural events within America and the uh, historical and cultural events throughout the world, you know. So beginning from 1946, the post-war period, uh, it, that's when, you know, we will primarily look at the theatrical events in America and I will leave you to understand how this could be mapped against the historical and cultural events in America as well as, you know, uh, in the rest of the world. Uh, so 1946 witnesses Eugene O'Neill's The Iceman uh, uh, Cometh and it is also, you know, the time when a series of such uh, 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 performances, musicals are uh, pr produced as you can see over here, Irving, Irving uh, Berlin, uh, Howard Lindsay, Maxwell Anderson, Lillian Hellman, Garson uh, Canine. Yeah, so these are, you know, uh, we haven't uh, gone into the details of these works, but of course we do get a sense of what kind of uh, performances these were from Eugene O'Neill's uh, work that we dealt with, Emperor Jones. There is a lot of, uh, there's a tendency to uh, experiment with expressionism, and there's also a tendency to get into the human uh, mind and to uh, you know, to do um, psychological exploration. Yeah, so we find that you know this is also the time when uh, a lot of new changes are happening within uh, America as well as elsewhere. In 1947, you know, a lot of um, uh, systemic changes, institutional changes are also happening. The actor studio opens. Uh, Robinson Ref Jeffers adapts media for the stage. Brecht is summoned to testify before the House um, Un-American Activities Committee. These are a few things that we have observed while we were looking at the uh, major backgrounds which influence the uh, American theater, major political background which influenced it. So this is also a time when uh, the UN, we find that you know around the same time, holds uh, uh, its first session. Italy becomes uh, 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 an independent republic. Yeah. So uh, even, you know, um, a few cultural changes also happen, like you know, bikini swimsuits are introduced around the same time. So we, you know, there, there's a lot of change, you know, Christian Dior introduces the new look into women's fashion, uh, feminine, full skirted, it differs greatly from wartime wear and fashion. So this shift is not just in terms of uh, what we understand as literature, culture or uh, politics. This affects the everyday life. There is a lot of change which is, which is coming into uh, being in the way 
in which people look at their everydayness and lived realities are undergoing a lot of change as well. And you know, there's something which is closer to home, which is mentioned here as well, Pandit Nehru and Muhammad Ali Jinnah, leaders of two major Indian political parties, Congress and Muslim League, endorse Britain's plan for partition of India. So the world order is entirely changing. This is 1947 when uh, American theater is beginning to bloom and the world economy, the world polity, the world, uh, the, the, the political climate and the cultural climate and the everyday climate is changing drastically too. Um, so Tennessee Williams, 19, uh, the, you know, the late 1940s continues uh, to be very interesting for America. A street cart named Desire, it opens on uh, Broadway where, you know, uh, with Marlon Brando, Arthur Millen's All My Sons. So it's a very, very prolific uh, period. Eugene O'Neill's A Moon for uh, Miss Begotten. Yeah, and uh, look at you know the some of the other everyday changes which are happening over here. Uh, first, microwave cooker is sold in the United States. It's also the year when Henry Ford uh, dies. So, uh, India gains independence, of course, and Camus' uh, uh, novel *The Plague* is uh, published, and Frank's diary is published. So, you find a range of things coming together, alternate histories getting created as well as foregrounded, yeah. So Anne Frank's diary is published which gives a different turn to the Holocaust history and the, in some sense, the colonial world, the colonial empire is coming to an end and it's at the same time when, you know, the a new uh, economic order is being created and, uh, you know, massively recreated to within America yeah? and, and, and newer kinds of technology are being explored, Polaroid uh, camera developed as you can see over here. So the transistor is uh, invented and um, uh, coming down in by 48, we find that um, the, a streetcar named Desire, it wins the Pulitzer Prize and the Drama Critics Award film, uh, a world premiere of uh, Brecht, the Caucasian Circle, you know, it happens in Carlton College. And uh, around the same time, um, a lot of, uh, uh, you know, controversial sort of uh, topics are also getting discussed, getting published. We find that pseudoscientific Kinsey report on male sexual uh, behavior is published. Henry Harry Truman is elected as uh, the 33rd president of America. The same year, you know, um, Mahatma Gandhi is assassinated in India. Orwell's uh, uh, 1984 is uh, published. So you find that, you know, this is a very, very turbulent period, the late 1940s. It is changing the world order, the course of history is getting radically changed and now we know, you know, the kind of anxiety and the kind of stress which has gone into the making of these plays is tremendous too. And it's also in the time when you know, the term Cold War begins to be coined by Bernard uh, Baruch and we find that, you know, this is a term which continues to be handy for the longest uh, time, you know, for the next uh, many, many decades. Arthur Miller's Death of a Salesman. You know, it has uh, performed on stage, it wins a Pulitzer Prize. Faulkner wins Nobel Prize for Literature. We find that American literature in general is also getting a lot of attention. Yeah, And uh, it is no longer, you know, the literary circle, the literary, uh, the, the inner circle is no longer uh, dominated by uh, just the English and, uh, you know, the Euro European writers, but we find that in America also becomes a major player. We find a lot of women writers gaining visibility too from the, you know, in the next couple of decades. So this is a time when, uh, uh, you know, the, the iconic work which changed the, uh, the, the way in which feminist movement uh, took off, you know, Second Sex by Simone de Beauvoir, uh, French uh, existentialist writer. So, and it's also the um, period when Pandit Nehru becomes the Prime Minister of uh, uh, India. So, we find a lot of changes happening simultaneously, politically, uh, culturally, philosophically, and there is a lot of visibility for race, gender, the colonized nations, yeah. Um, so, multiple things are happening at the same time. So the color television broadcast begins and we find that, you know, this new modes of entertainment are a challenge as well as a, a supplementary product when we look at uh, literature and culture. Um, and we find that, you know, during this time, 
the number of plays that they are there that are getting um, debuted on Broadway it's also coming down during 4950 season only 59 new plays are uh, debut on Broadway it's also you know the same time when color television broadcasts begin and uh, uh, Korean war begins to it's not a peaceful time all around you know but the, the international politics is uh, uh, getting more and more uh, turbulent as we can see despite you know the second world war having come to an end but we realize that you know each nation also seems to have their own way to uh, deal with it as well yeah. so 50 1950 is also the year when Arthur Miller uh, his version of Ibsen's An Enemy of the People is being performed and uh, National Council of Churches is established which is also you know giving us uh, uh, some kind of a lead into how uh, the uh, secular politics and the need to contain religion it takes a, a more systematic more institutionalized uh, form as well uh, Eugene Ionescu's play The Lesson Christopher Fry's play A Sleep of Prisoners yeah Dali is painting The Christ of St. John on the Cross yeah so uh, all of these things are happening simultaneously as you can see over here the American Shakespeare Theatre is founded in Connecticut so 52 is when you know the uh, US explodes the first hydrogen bomb uh, in the Pacific here yeah? and we find that you know uh, the uh, theatre the performances the productions they are continuing to uh, gain momentum though the numbers perhaps you know have come down there's a polio epidemic in America around there's a polio epidemic in America around this time so uh, we will quickly go down to the end of the 1950s a lot of American writers they continue to win awards international awards popular culture is also taking a, a very different turn altogether 56 is uh, when you know Elvis Presley's Heartbreak Hotel is uh, released and an oral vaccine against polio is getting developed we find that the scientific uh, um, you know advancements are also going simultaneously along with the emergence of uh, popular culture and nothing seems to affect anything there is a growing stress there's a growing anxiety uh, there's an increasing need to deal with all of these things simultaneously but we find that you know the world is uh, galloping forward in this uh, newly acquired uh, format of modernity if we look at 1959 the year when you know the uh, the turn of the decade which becomes extremely important um, for our understanding too so 1959 is when Lorraine Hansberry's A Raisin in the Sun it showcases the tribulations of a struggling black family opens to a boisterous critical and popular praise and it's also the time when America launches its first atomic submarine and the first atomic powered cargo ship yeah the first Barbie doll is also introduced in California around this time Xerox introduces its first copier the twist dance is introduced so look at the range of things which is happening and now you know I think we are better equipped to understand the background uh, where you know all of these things are happening in a uh, zoo story or in uh, Hansberry's play Edward Albee's the zoo story premieres in uh, Berlin yeah and it's also another interesting twist you know Albee's zoo story premieres not in America but in Berlin and uh, Ionescu's you know uh, the rhinoceros yeah uh, Jean Janet's the blacks yeah uh, Charles de Gaulle becomes the president of France yeah so multiple things happening in a way that you know this uh, uh, struggle which is captured in a zoo story or in um, uh, a raisin in the sun it raisin in the sun it feels more and more real over here yeah so with this you know we will bring this discussion to an end I hope you've got a sense of how turbulent those times were how diverse those times were and how despite the um, and and how uh, through you know perhaps one or two individual characters or a family what these playwrights are actually trying to capture is not just the spirit of America but the spirit of the entire world itself the changing world order the changing uh, political order and more importantly trying to understand each person's uh, worth and identity in these changing times so with that note we will bring this discussion to an end for today i thank you for your time and i look forward to seeing you in the next session